Good day. There's a rather interesting article today which has appeared in the Guardian newspaper in Britain, a newspaper which I believe is also widely read in the United States and which can be said to be strongly aligned with the Democratic Party in the United States and which takes a similar view of things as the New York Times and the Washington Post and MSNBC and CNN all do. In this article, Thomas Frank who, it should be said, is one of the more measured voices in The Guardian, tries to get his head round the possibility that the COVID pandemic was caused by a leak from the Wuhan laboratory in China, after all, and that it might not have been the result of natural evolution of a virus that somehow jumped from the natural um, wild population to humans after all. Well, this is a th uh, theory, the theory that the um, uh, virus, the, uh, the uh, virus which has caused the pandemic, um, this was a theory which a few weeks or months ago would have got you branded a conspiracy theorist if you had promoted it or spread it around, and which, if you'd published it on certain social media sites, would have probably got you, at, um, at, at the very least, demonetized, or quite probably facing a strike, and if you'd persisted with it, probably deplatformed. Franks is bewildered that this theory, called a conspiracy theory, just a few weeks ago, is now the subject of formal investigation by the intelligence agencies of the United States and on the instructions of Joe Biden, a liberal president, who people like The Guardian and Tom Franks vehemently supported in the election last year against Donald Trump. Um, Franks complains that if the theory is proved to be true, his world will be turned upside down. He also makes certain comments in the course of this article about other facts about the Trump period, which perhaps are interesting in themselves. He actually alludes to the fact that social media might have banned you for spreading a theory which could possibly be true. He also complains, or, or at least alludes to, the fact that Russiagate might not have been true after all. By the way, he actually uses the word Russiagate to uh, refer to that vast, all-embracing conspiracy theory which took up so much of our time for so many years whilst Donald Trump was first a presidential candidate and then president of the United States, whereby he owed his election in 2016 to the Russians with whom he was supposedly in some form of conspiracy or collusion. The word Russiagate, I should explain, very rarely appears in the British media, in The Guardian especially, it is extremely unusual. And when it is used at all, it tends to be used by people like myself, who have always been not only sceptical, but in my case, frankly disbelieving of what I have always saw, seen as an entirely preposterous theory. Well, there you go. Thomas Franks is clearly on a journey of discovery. You might even speak of a Damascene conversion. I doubt that The Guardian as a whole is going to go quite as far as he apparently is doing. But this brings me to the key point about this article, uh, this, this video. Firstly, I should make it very clear that on the specific issue of the Wuhan laboratory leak or presumed Wuhan laboratory the uh, leak, I am a total agnostic. I don't have the scientific knowledge to d debate this issue 
uh, in any intelligent way. I know that leaks do happen in laboratories. I accept that if a leak did happen in a laboratory, the government of China is probably the only government around the world, other than possibly North Korea, that might have successfully covered it up. But against that, I have to say that at the moment, the evidence that the, um, that the pandemic actually began as a result of such a leak is not so much small as non-existent. It is at the moment a hypothesis, not even a theory, and certainly not a theory that you could support with actual facts. The mere fact that there is a laboratory in Wuhan that does work on viruses like the coronavirus does not prove that this pandemic began with a leak. Having said that, and I want to stress this again, even if this does not rise to the standard of proof, it is also the case that the mere fact that this is a hypothesis does not prove that it is wrong. Perhaps it is right. Certainly an investigation is in order, and certainly the investigation that was previously done by the World Health Organization hardly inspires confidence. I'm also very quickly and in parenthesis going to say that in my opinion the investigation so-called that President Biden has ordered the intelligence agencies of the United States to carry out carries no credibility either. After all it was the intelligence agencies who tried to sell us Russiagate and that as I have said was not only not true, it was actually preposterous. That's all I'm going to say about the Wuhan lab leak theory. Um, others who are more informed about this or have stronger views are welcome to them. And I should make it very clear that, reg uh, that regardless of my own um, agnosticism on the issue, I believe fully that anybody who has an opinion on this topic should be allowed to express it. And I have always opposed and strongly opposed censorship on this issue. But that's not really the topic that I want to discuss today. That topic is the way in which the Biden administration is quietly adopting more and more of the policies that were associated with Donald Trump and which a year ago were universally derided in the liberal media in the United States and in Britain and specifically on in the pages of The Guardian and in much of Europe as crazed and wrong and populist and fantastical. Let's just tick off a few examples. Firstly, Russia. This was the point where so much trouble, uh, Donald Trump got into so much trouble. He always made known, whilst he was on the campaign trail in 2015, and shortly after he became president, and during the period of his presidency, that he wanted very much to reopen a dialogue with Russia. He had a uh, summit meeting with President Putin of Russia in 2018, and of course he also met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in the Oval Office shortly after he was elected. Every move, every step Donald Trump took towards trying to reopen that dialogue with Russia became the object of relentless uh, attack, abuse and derision. Not just, I would add, from the Liberals and the Democrats, but by many, perhaps most of the members of the Republican Party in Congress. Every step he took in the direction of negotiating and talking and speaking to the Russians was seen by many people as proof, as confirmation that he was in fact indeed engaged in some kind of sinister conspiracy with the Russians exactly as the Russiagate conspiracy theorists alleged. In fact, 
I can even remember absurd claims that he deliberately leaked information to Lavrov over the course of that meeting in the Oval Office, and that when he went to meet Putin in Helsinki in 2018, he was actually taking instructions from Putin, who was in some way his controller. I mean, this is all extraordinary and deranged stuff. Well, what have we seen since Joe Biden became president? An attempt, however uncertain, however contradictory, by the administration, the new administration, to improve relations with Russia. First of all, we had that agreement to extend the New START Treaty, something which, by the way, Donald Trump did not wish to do. We have seen um, attempts to dial down the sanctions policy. We have seen an agreement to allow Nord Stream 2 to be built between Russia and Germany, a pipeline, by the way, which Donald Trump did his best to stop. And, of course, we have seen an agreement between Biden and Putin to hold a summit meeting. That very thing that led to the most relentless abuse of Donald Trump, his agreement to meet with Putin on a one-to-one -one basis in Helsinki in 2018, is now going to happen between Biden and Putin in a few days in Geneva. Quite an astonishing reversal. One totally contrary, by the way, to what the United States was led to expect by candidate Biden and the Democrats during the 2020 election. Over the course of that election, the entire political narrative was that Biden would stand up to Putin in a way that the allegedly or supposedly deeply compromised Trump uh, uh, never did. Well, in fact, it is Biden who has made by far the bigger concessions to Putin up to now, more concessions, in fact, than Donald Trump ever did. So that's one. That's one situation where we see the Biden administration increasingly becoming the Trump administration, at least in terms of its overt policies. Let's talk about China, another, another area where there was an enormous amount of controversy and anger and disputes and things of that kind. Well, um, after all, um, we were told while Donald Trump was president, that his attitude to China was somehow xenophobic. It was implied that it was in some way racist, that um, he was accused of wrecking a wonderful relationship that had been built up with the Chinese. And there were vehement criticisms of his misguided economic policies, his uh, uh, mistakes in trying to uh, emphasize or prioritize trade in relations with Beijing and in his criticisms, which he did make from time to time, of the Chinese government and of the way that China ran things. Well, what has happened? In reality, relations between China and the United States since the new administration took over in January have actually got worse. They're actually worse now than they were whilst Donald Trump was president. And I think this point needs actually to be emphasised because though Donald Trump was indeed extremely critical of China and did make all kinds of comments about China and did criticise China's human rights record, and though it's certainly true that it was during the time that Donald Trump was president that the issue of the Uyghurs was brought up and that that was for the first time classified by the United States as a genocide. One always got the impression with Donald Trump that ultimately these were all steps by a person who, at least in his own self-conception, was a master dealmaker to try to do some great overarching deal with Beijing. 
Specifically, Donald Trump seems to have wanted, above all else, to end what he saw as a massive economic imbalance in the trade relationship between China and the United States. China pursued, and actually does still pursue, very much what you might call protectionist policies. The United States, with China, ever since the 1990s, has, to all intents and purposes, until Donald Trump became president, uh, held the door open to China and to Chinese goods. One consequence of that is that US companies relocated much of their production to China, whereas, and of course the Chinese, benefited by exporting all that production from those factories back to the United States. The Chinese, of course, uh, and this must be said, went ahead and forged uh, 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 forward and worked hard and built up their own industries and built up their own technologies and have managed also to develop their own companies, which also trade and export to the United States to China's advantage. But the result is, and this is indisputable, that the United States runs a massive and growing deficit with China, one which gets ever greater. And Donald Trump, worried about the state of America's industrial base and worried about American jobs, wanted to reverse that. Much of his rhetoric against Beijing and much of the action of his administration seems to have been focused on getting the Chinese to agree to rectify that. Having it had Trump been left to himself, I am sure that that is what he would have wanted. A situation where, after all the hard words, after all the abuse, after all the, the, the ugly things that went backwards and forwards, some kind of grand bargain with the Chinese would have been done to rebalance the trade relationship and to give the United States time and space in order to rebuild its industrial base. Moreover, as someone who follows the Chinese media, at least the English language Chinese media, fairly closely, I think I'm right in saying that the Chinese, for all their strong criticisms of Donald Trump, knew that perfectly well. They understood what Donald Trump's ultimate objective was, and though they are tough and unyielding negotiators, over time, they too, in their own interests, were, were prepared to accept the logic of the kind of grand bargain that Trump had in mind, and a deal would have been done. Well, what has happened instead? Well, first of all, it's quite clear that the current administration continues the same hard line against China that Donald Trump um, adopted, but it's taken it in a completely different direction. I don't get much impression that this administration is particularly interested in trade or economics. Unlike Donald Trump, who took the growth of Chinese power in his stride, being as he was focused on the internal conditions of the United States, they, the new administration sees China instead very much as a geopolitical challenge which must be contained. In that, it is closer in some ways to the ideas associated with Donald Trump's Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, than it is with Donald Trump himself. So we have all these lurid articles that now appear sourced from anonymous spokesmen about how China supposedly is out to displace the United States as the world's greatest power and about Xi, how Xi Jinping is the new Stalin out to establish a new hegemony in substitution for the United States 
even as he ruthlessly clamps down on dissent within China itself. I would add that all of these claims, it seems to me, are unrealistic and in the case of Xi Jinping, almost entirely wrong. I don't believe that Xi Jinping is any less tolerant of dissent within China than his predecessors were. I think anybody who thinks that the Chinese government has at any time in its existence been tolerant of dissent within China is simply ignorant of China. And I think that Xi Jinping simply marks a continuation of policies which have existed previously. But that's, again, something of an aside. The overarching story, the overarching point I want to make is that whereas just a year ago, Donald Trump was being criticised by the Democrats for wrecking this good relationship with China and by putting America's economic position in jeopardy by doing so, today the Democrats are pursuing that rivalry with China, but to a far greater extent than he ever envisaged or intended. Let's turn to another issue, Afghanistan. Donald Trump wanted to withdraw US troops from Afghanistan. He tried to do it re repeatedly. He was very, very critical of the way in which the Pentagon was insisting on keeping troops in Afghanistan. He had major quarrels with his former de his, uh, defense secretary, James Mattis, over the issue. And he was deeply frustrated by the Pentagon's inability to come up with a plan for victory in Afghanistan and at the same time and simultaneously its resistance to any proposal that US troops be pulled out of Afghanistan. Right up to the last days of his administration, Donald Trump was trying to pull troops out of Afghanistan and, being, and was being prevented from doing so. An important topic, by the way, which I'm going to discuss in another video. Well, what has happened? The Biden administration, Joe Biden, um, whilst he was candidate, was also a critic of the policy of pulling troops out of Afghanistan. So were the Democrats. So, by the way, was The Guardian. It was all about the betrayal of women in Afghanistan and how the rights of women would be sacrificed if troops were to be pulled out of Afghanistan. We had ludicrous claims that the Russians would fill in the vacuum if the United States pulled out of Afghanistan and that this was further proof of the fact that Donald Trump was in some sort of collusion with the Russians. We had all sorts of preposterous stories about the Russians paying bounties to the Taliban to murder American soldiers in Afghanistan and about Donald Trump's secret appeasement of the Russians by his alleged attempts to conceal that utterly fictitious story. We had all of that and moreover, the Pentagon in its resistance to Donald Trump's orders to pull out of Afghanistan was always able to rely on an unholy alliance in Congress of the Democratic Party and the very powerful neocon anti-Trump tendency within the Republican Party to block every attempt that Donald Trump made to pull US troops out of Afghanistan. So what happens when the new administration comes into office, lo and behold, the troops are going to be pulled out of Afghanistan. Joe Biden announces it, and it's going to happen by September. And there's been muted criticism and little discussion, though it's known, widely known, that the Pentagon is unhappy. I've recently done a programme in which I've also said that the United States is probably also, before very long, going to pull out its troops from Syria, something else which Donald Trump repeatedly sought to do and was repeatedly criticised for trying to do. 
and that the uh, visit, the recent visit by a US, uh, strong US delegation to Syria and the U recent US decision to stop pumping oil in northeast Syria are all steps made in that direction. We will see whether I am right, but I'm so confident of that that, frankly, I would put money on it if I was a gambling man, which for various reasons, by the way, I am not. And then last but not least, we have the Wuhan laboratory leak story. Now, I am not, as I said, going to come down on one side or the other on this issue. I simply don't know what the facts are. And I doubt, actually, if I have to say the truth, that we will ever, in truth, and we will ever, in fact, know the full truth. The Chinese will always deny that there was a leak, if ever there was, even if there was one. And people in the, some people in the United States and in Europe will always insist that there was a leak, even if they cannot prove the fact that there was one, and even if no such leak did, in fact, take place. So I have no confidence that we will ever know the truth about this issue. But here again, and yet again, we see a theory which Donald Trump sort of played with. He never fully adopted it, but people close to him did. Um, suddenly become, if not quite the new orthodoxy, at least become mainstream. Whereas... Just a few weeks ago, just a few months ago, it was constantly and repeatedly branded as another lunatic Trumpian fantasy, more evidence of the president's, the president being Donald Trump's disconnection from reality, his propensity for, to lie, alleged propensity to lie, his living in what some people ludicrously, in my opinion, like to call a post-truth world. And that's why we see people like Mr. Franks in The Guardian today so bewildered. Because from their point of view, if they are at all reflective, and one does get the sense that Mr. Franks is a reflective person, the world is now upside down. All the things that Donald Trump was being so bitterly criticised for when he was president, relations with China, relations with Russia, <laughs> the closeness to Putin, the willingness to meet with Putin, the um, um, uh, Wuhan lab leak theory, Russiagate, all of these things, Afghanistan, the Afghan pullout, the possible Syria pullout, all of these things which associated with Donald Trump, it turns out that Trump was either right or was doing these same things that the Biden administration, that great administration that the liberals so struggled and fought to establish, is going to do as well. Now, it's trite and banal to say that Donald Trump was a man ahead of his time. I think when people say that, they're nearly always playing a game of self-apology. Donald Trump was not a man ahead of his time. What he was doing when he was president was always and at all times self-evidently in the interests of the United States as he construed them. You could disagree with his policies, but there was never any doubt, at least in my opinion, that they were rational policies and they were being rationally pursued. Sometimes his language got a bit out of control, but ultimately when you went behind the language, you could always see the logic of what he was doing. It's also probably fair to say that in the case of Donald Trump, he was always more an instinctual politician somebody who had a feel for things rather than someone who would sit down and think it all out and work it through in the way that perhaps more structured leaders, people like Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping, tend to do. But there we are, an instinctive political leader 
can sometimes, it, very often in fact, be right on most things and more right than people who sit down and try and calculate and think things, things through will allow for and sometimes are. Having said that, as I said, it's banal to think that it was a case of Donald Trump being, you know, um, in advance ahead of his time. The reason that all of these policies, all of these theories were criticised so vehemently whilst Donald Trump was president was not because they were wrong, but because he was president. The Democrats, for all sorts of reasons, absolutely loathed the personality of Donald Trump. They never forgave him for the fact that he unexpectedly beat, beat them in the election in 2016, which they, where they confidently expected that Hillary Clinton would inherit Barack Obama's mantle. And as an outsider, he was also deeply mistrusted by the entire US political class, which, of course, he said that he would purge Remember all that drain the swamp rhetoric. So they went out to sabotage him by pursuing a relentless personal attack against him, uh, relentless personal attacks against him, right through the period when he was president. But for me, what makes it really difficult and really exasperating is that, yes, it's the case that now that he's out of the way, these people feel able to adopt all his policies, even though, of course, they don't give him any credit for doing so. But they still call into question his loyalty to the United States. They still imply that by pursuing the very policies that they have now adopted, Donald Trump was in some way engaged in something, if not exactly treasonous, perhaps close to treason, and in the case of the fanatical Russiagate believe, believers, absolutely treason. I think it's high time that we put all that to bed and accepted that that was a calumny and a smear of a patriotic man who for all his faults and for all his uh, mistakes, did his best. The great French foreign minister once said, uh, uh, Charles de Talleyrand once said, when asked what treason was, he said, treason is a matter of dates. For the Democrats, it looks increasingly as if with respect to Donald Trump, treason was always a matter of dates. When he was president, things which today are permitted were then treasonous. And treason was simply being Donald Trump. I have to say that I think this has been one of the darkest moments in the history of America. And I think lots of people, not just Mr. Franks, looking back, should feel ashamed. Thank you very much for joining me on this programme. I look forward to you joining me on future programmes on this channel. And last but not least, do check out our shop and look up the wonderful things that you will see there. And support us at the Duran in the difficult work we do, which is trying to tell you the truth, at least as we see it, and to the extent that the truth is ever known or knowable. Thank you very much for watching me in this programme today.